Oh, good afternoon. Um, although it says I'm Katrin Johnson, I am really George Yanakis. I work for the Washington State Office of Public Defense. And we have a great opportunity here this afternoon as uh, Dr. Mark Cunningham will be talking about the implications of juvenile brain development for youthful offending and sentencing. Uh, Dr. Cunningham is a forensic psychologist and he is um, certified in 16 states. He's presented in, he's he has testified in a number of major cases in Washington, a couple of death penalty cases a few years ago. Um, I first heard Dr. Cunningham speak at the National Association of Public Defenders in March, and I was just captivated with the information that he was providing and his style of providing it. Um, I think he is an excellent presenter, and I think we are all looking forward to hearing about his um, work. I think uh, he will, uh, I think on his slides, he'll show about a number of the awards that he has won. He's a prolific writer. He has done uh, a lot of amazing work and I think we'll all be impressed. So this is uh, a, a training that's presented by the Washington State Office of Public Defense. And I and Katrin Johnson are program managers there working with trial level um, <clears throat> improving trial level defense. At the end of the program, we will be explaining a little bit more of our work in the Tri-Cities under our regional defense, juvenile defense initiative um, that will be starting up here in the next month or two. It's great to see so many people from Benton Franklin County here. Elizabeth, nice to see you again so soon and Daryl. Um, and we will be going, starting, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cunningham right now. He's going to speak for about 70 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. If you do have questions before that, please put them in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get those answered. Okay, Dr. Cunningham, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, George. I appreciate that introduction and the opportunity to speak to you guys. Uh, about the implications that a juvenile brain development has for youthful offending and, uh, and sentencing. Uh, any questions that you have uh, that I might be able to address, I'm happy to speak to you. This is my email address. My other contact information is on the uh, title slide. So, so don't hesitate to reach out if there's some additional resources that I might provide. I, uh, I, uh, a maxim that I operate under as I was involved in clinical work, uh, as well as in forensic consultations, is a quote from Henry David Thoreau, that it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And that's particularly important in the area of understanding juvenile offending and juvenile sentencing. And so I'm hopeful that some of the concepts that are talked about today Will, uh, will broaden your perspectives about what you see as you examine uh, these cases. Uh, as we think about youthful sentencing, there are two broad categories where there are implications for that. There are the offenders that were pre-18 at the time of their offense. Uh, and of course that comes out of, of uh, Roper and Graham and Miller and these cases that talk about pre-18 offending. And then there's another group of youthful offenders uh, uh, and the, what I call the age of ambiguity where youthfulness still has, brain development still has implications. And this is for offenders that were between the ages of 18 and 24 uh, at the time of their offenses. And this extends, you know, as we think about the pre-18 uh, offending, that's the Houston Sconyers uh, decision as we would apply Miller to Washington uh, State, and then Odell looking at this age between 18 and 24. Uh, the types of cases may be those that are currently being sentenced, who are pre-18 or post-18 but still youthful, or it may be the resentencing of a defendant who's coming back because the court uh, had no mechanism 
to uh, appreciate the mitigating impact that youthfulness uh, may have had or fail to appreciate that. And so those are the two contexts that this sort of work arises in. As we think about the sentencing considerations and where this falls within these sentencing considerations, there are four broad sentencing considerations. One of those is the needs of justice. What does justice call for in response to this offense? There's general deterrence, which is the message that's sent to society uh, to discourage this sort of offending. There's moral culpability, which has to do with the resources you bring to your decision making. And there is specific deterrence. What do we need to do uh, in order to keep this offender from offending again or to reduce the likelihood of that? Now, those first two, the needs of justice and general deterrence, those are social values that a psychologist has no more expertise in than anyone else. The ones that can be illuminated by psychological science are these are numbers three and four, moral culpability and specific deterrence. And that's what we're gonna be focused on today. But I certainly wanna acknowledge that as the court is considering uh, sentencing in these cases, there are two others that are beyond the purview of clinical and forensic psychology. Now, this concept of moral culpability is a term of art in other words, it's a term that's understood not by uh, disaggregating the two terms. It really is not about morality, and it's not about culpability in terms of criminal responsibility and, and facing criminal jeopardy for the offense. Instead, uh, it's kind of like my degree. My terminal degree is a doctor of philosophy. I have actually never had a course in philosophy. Doctor of philosophy is a term of art. It's the highest academic degree that can be given in any discipline. So somebody gets a doctor of philosophy degree in chemistry or mathematics or English or history. And so it's a term of art. You, many of you will hold a Juris Doctor, even though you never see a patient. It's a term of art. And so this term of art refers to what the Supreme Court has called the diverse frailties of mankind. It's the raw material that you bring to your decision making. And it captures the notion that everybody has a choice. They just don't have the same choice. They have a choice that emanates out of the raw materials available to them to bring to their decision making. And moral culpability is not something that's either present or absent. There's not a bright line test. Instead, this exists on a continuum. You can see that this moral culpability is not my language. It's in the Supreme Court a case law in Roper v. Simmons. It talks about the culpability or blameworthiness is diminished. Uh, in Graham, there's a discussion of twice diminished moral culpability. Uh, in Miller, the same sorts of things as it's talking about the implications of varying degrees of resources and how those are distinct among younger offenders as compared to those that are older. Now to, to think about differentiating this, this term of art, moral culpability from criminal responsibility. Criminal responsibility, of course, is a guilt phase issue. And it involves things like, could he control himself? Did he have a choice? Did he know right from wrong? Now, at the point that someone is convicted of a, a serious felony, these questions have virtually always been answered yes with a guilty verdict. If, if the person did not meet these standards, he'd likely to be found not guilty by reason of insanity or he'd like some necessary element of the offense. So these are great questions, but they're questions that are answered by a guilty verdict uh, at that guilt phase. And so they really, because they're always answered yes, they really don't help us very much as we think about what sentence to now apply to this person who's been identified and found guilty. So now we're at the sentencing phase and it's no longer a function, is he criminal responsible? He is criminally responsible. That's why he was found guilty of this. We're not in the guilt phase, we're at the sentencing phase. And now it's not so much a bright line test of could he control himself, but what diminished his control? Not did he have a choice, but what shaped the choice or the perception of choices that were available? 
Not so much do you know right from wrong, but what shaped his morality and value system and what capabilities did he have to bring moral discernments to bear? So it has less to do with what did he do than how did we get here or how is this person damaged or limited? So these were all great questions. They're questions that are already answered by a guilty verdict. So I may sometimes be on the stand and be asked, well, Dr. Cunningham, you're not saying he couldn't control himself, are you? You're not saying he didn't know right from wrong, are you? You're not saying you didn't have a choice, are you? Well, of course not. But those are questions that are already satisfied before we get to this phase of sentencing. Now, here's a model that you can, uh, that, that may help further clarify this notion of moral culpability and what it has to do with damaging or limiting or impairing factors and how it relates to choice. So you've got a scale of moral culpability from high to low over on the right. We've got choice because there's always a choice. And then we have the damaging or impairing factors that may be identified in the course of the evaluation. Well, those greater those damaging or impairing or limiting factors, the steeper the angle of the choice, the more inclined it is toward poor decision making and correspondingly, the lower the level of moral culpability, greater limitation and impairment, steeper angle of the choice, lower level of moral culpability. So as we think about the relevance of this model uh, to, of youthfulness uh, to moral culpability, we can now see the primary limiting factor as being one of immaturity. The greater that immaturity, the more inclined the choice is to poor decision-making, poor judgment, the lower the degree of moral culpability. So this is what the Supreme Court is describing in terms of the implications of youthfulness and the features that are associated with it, that those are limiting and allow less resources to be brought to bear than if we were talking about an adult offender who did the same uh, offense. Now, the second sentencing consideration is specific deterrence. And largely there, we're talking about parole recidivism. Uh, how long is this person gonna be in custody and what's the likelihood then of their recidivating on parole? Although it's conceivable in a youthful case that we might also be looking at likelihood of reoffending on probation if that was uh, what was uh, identified. Now, this specific deterrence feature also is illustrated in the landmark Supreme Court case law uh, re regarding youthfulness. So in Graham v. Florida, a Graham deserved to be separated from society for some time in order to prevent what the trial court described as an escalating pattern of criminal conduct. But it does not follow he would be a risk to society for the rest of his life. So it captures this notion of specific deterrence for a period of time, not indefinitely. And then uh, also in Graham v. Florida, the, the assertion is made that it's, or the findings made that it's the rare juvenile offender whose crime reflects irreparable corruption. In other words, it's rare for the juvenile offense to be predictive of enduring inclinations or high risk of uh, serious future conduct. So this is where the juvenile offending research is so important, not only to moral culpability, but also to specific deterrence. Because the vast majority of juvenile offenders, including those who commit serious crimes, grow out of antisocial activity as they transition into adulthood. So let me give you an example of a, a, a well-known study regarding this. Uh, so Steinberg, Kaufman, and Monahan uh, found through their research that juvenile offending was largely limited to adolescence. This is a piece of research that was sponsored by the US Department of Justice. It looked at 1,300 juvenile offenders who were followed for seven years after their conviction. And here's what they found. The process of maturing out of crime is linked to the process of maturing more generally, including the development of impulse control and future orientation. In other words, as brain development progresses and all the rest of the psychological functions are becoming more mature, that has direct implications for the likelihood of ongoing offending in the future. 
Uh, and so there, this, this large scale longitudinal study demonstrating that most adolescent offenders desist from crime as adults, uh, then is consistent with the uh, amnesty brief filed by the American Psychological Association that concluded that only a small portion of adolescents who experiment with illegal activities will develop an entrenched pattern of criminal behavior that extends and persists into adulthood. So this conclusion extends even to serious adolescent offenders as well. So even those that have committed the gravest of offenses, even there, the gravity of the offense does not reflect an irredeemably corrupt character. So it's the idea that it's the immaturity that is significantly driving this choice, not only lowering moral culpability, but also having implications for specific deterrence, because as that immaturity is lessened, the quality of choices that are made improves. So our, our takeaway and, and, a, and an important notion as we think about this is that juvenile offending then is most often an expression of immaturity. That's most often what it's an expression of. And so as you think about maturity involving uh, features that adults have, so Steinberg and, and Kaufman and Monahan identified that desistance from crime in, as adults, the reason why adults don't commit crimes as often as juveniles is number one, temperance. That's the ability to control impulses, including aggressive impulses. Perspective, the ability to consider other points of view. And that involves taking into consideration the long-term consequences for the offender as well as for the victim and being able to have a vantage point that includes the long-term perspective a victim might have, and responsibility, the ability to take personal responsibility for one's behavior and resist the coercive influences of others. These are all qualities that are growing uh, as the, the, the brain becomes better wired and better integrated as an apparatus. Now, to break that down more specifically, to operationalize what, what maturity is and what immaturity is. So maturity involves, a, and you can think easily make the connection of how this relates to offending among juveniles. Maturity involves effective impulse control, a realistic appraisal of apprehension, of course, a hallmark of adolescent offending is that very often the plan doesn't extend more than a few hours or a few days past the offense itself with all kinds of things that are going on that are increasing the number of witnesses and the likelihood of apprehension. They just aren't calculating that. The calculus doesn't include that. A recognition of long-term consequences to personal outcome identification and empathy with potential victims, development of an identity as a law-abiding citizen and as a moral individual, a sense of reciprocal obligation to family and others, an identification with the community and community values, an appreciation of the collective good, as well as a mature commitment to a religious or ethical belief system. So these are the things that allow adults to, it, to be law abiding and, and adhere to these social standards that are lacking among juveniles. So as a juvenile is offending, very often it's an expression of this, this immaturity as embedded in these factors. We can think of, a ju of juvenile offending as being perhaps one of the more serious demonstrations of immaturity because it has such grave consequences that are not being taken into consideration for the, for the offender, the juvenile, as well as for other people. As the gravity of the offense grows, that does not demonstrate greater sophistication. That in many ways reflects greater immaturity because now the consequences are even greater, the repercussions are even greater for this poor decision-making. Now, at sentencing, there is a, a backdrop 
at a meta analysis as, as we think about the, the broad picture, kind of looking at the meta level on this, there, there are dueling theories at sentencing. There's free will versus what I would call soft determinism. So as we look at this, the free will approach, I characterize as a dispositional choice theory. And that's the idea that this person has made an evil choice and that demonstrates that he is an evil person. And of course, an evil person is gonna make evil choices. So this is kind of a circular loop. The bad thing that you did demonstrates that you have a bad heart and your bad heart is then what leads you to do bad things. And so this is the idea that this offense is the wholly volitional product of a malignantly evil heart. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, and that malignantly evil heart is demonstrated by the bad deed that's occurred. And of course, because this is an evil person, once a criminal, always a, a criminal. So th th now this, go, th this has implications for their enduring risk because after all, they have demonstrated that they are an evil person that's gonna make evil choices again in the future. So th this is why this individual, and, and even if they killed somebody, this is the same thing that holds. So the implications of this dispositional choice theory are that an evil heart will keep finding malevolent expressions. In other words, will continue to make evil choices. So of course he must be quarantined as long as possible. All right, this, this dispositional choice theory is what seemed to guide serious juvenile offending pre-Graham, pre-Miller, pre-Roper that then warranted and justified automatic sentencing for life without parole or imposition of the death penalty for in a crime that was done when somebody was 17 because of, of an endorsement of this dispositional choice theory. Now, the alternative to that is a developmental theory. And that's really what has moved to the forefront in these Supreme Court cases and in the Washington youthful offender cases. And that's the notion that youthfulness matters. Now, this has significantly been driven by research on brain development. This is an area where the science of psychology has fundamentally intersected with and informed public policy and criminal law, juvenile law. With stated most simply, that youthfulness equals brain immaturity. Now, here's what's happening as the brain develops between the ages of 12 and 25. That development begins at the back of the brain and moves forward across the cortex and underlying structures up to the, to the front of the brain. With the frontal lobes being among the last to become fully developed, what do your frontal lobes do for you? Well, that's problem solving, spontaneity, memory, language, motivation, judgment, impulse control, social and sexual behavior. So as this wave is developing from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, the structures that are most implicated in bad decision-making uh, uh, um, among juvenile offenders and particularly serious juvenile offenders, those are being mediated by the frontal lobes. And that's what, what is the, are the last structures to fully come online. Uh, so your frontal lobe is what takes a second look. It's what relooks at this situation after you've had an initial impulse to proceed. Now, this notion that youthfulness is directly related to bad decision making or to vulnerable decision making is not a, something that we just figured out. This has been uh, socially known for thousands of years. Aristotle said, youth are heated by nature as drunken men by wine. And Shakespeare in the Winter's Tale said, I would that there were no age between 10 and 23, for there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing, fighting. So we've known this about juveniles 
We just didn't know that this was directly re related to brain development. We knew it was anchored to age. We didn't have the research that let us know that, that in fact, there were identifiable brain processes that are at play in this, uh, uh, in this issue. So the developmental theory identifies that there is a youth who has behaved in an impulsive way. Uh, and so Miller v. Alabama and then Houston Sconyers quotes from Miller v. Alabama to this effect that said that identifies chronological age and its hallmark features. What are those? Among them, immaturity, impetuosity, and failure to appreciate risk and consequences. What is impetuosity and failure to consider risk and consequences? That, that's impulsive behavior. Now, it's important as you think about impulsivity to be aware that there are two types of impulsivity. First, there's reactive impulsivity. That's an immediate response to provocation or opportunity or urge. You know, somebody bumps you and you shove them. It is spontaneous with little planning or preparation. And reactive impulsivity is most characteristic of preschool age children or adults who are angry or intoxicated, perhaps an elderly person who's demented. You may see elements of reactive impulsivity among a youthful offender as they react immediately to something that happens that was perhaps unexpected in the, in the nature of the offense. So there's reactive impulsivity, but it's not the primary impulsivity that, that is in play in juvenile offending. Instead, juvenile offending typically involves judgment impulsivity. Well, what's judgment impulsivity? Well, judgment impulsivity is I meet a woman today, Friday, and we spend the next three days planning our lives together. And on Sunday or Monday, we get married. Now we've spent three days planning this, but it remains profoundly impulsive. And so here there is planning, but it's ill-conceived. There's an adequate weighing of the consequences that are at stake. There is a curtailed future projection that perhaps only extends hours or days, not in an extended way into the future. Uh, I routinely use this analogy of you meet a woman today and three days later you get married because often impulsivity is misunderstood as it's only impulsive if it's reactive. And if there was planning, then it can't be impulsive. And I find this analogy to be very powerful in reframing this. And I've testified about it many times. I have never on cross-examination had someone take me on to say, now come on, Dr. Cunningham, if they planned it for three days and then got married, it wasn't impulsive, was it? Because that's so blatantly obvious uh, on a face inspection. All right, so it's in, their behavior is impulsive and it's also context vulnerable. Now this also is cited in Miller v. Alabama and then Houston Sconyers uh, quotes from this as well this notion of vulnerability to context. So that language from Miller, it prevents taking into account the family and home environment that surrounds him and from which he cannot usually extricate himself, no matter how brutal or dysfunctional. It neglects the circumstances of the homicide offense, including the extent of his participation in the conduct and the way familial and peer pressures may have affected him. Now, as you're aware, a fundamental feature of that, that, is, that is so common on, in juvenile offending is that they carry out their offenses in concert with youthful co-defendants. So now you have their immaturity plus the addition of peers. Now, my dad has a saying, one boy is a boy, two boys are half a boy, and three boys are no boy at all. And that's the idea that as you add other youthful brains to the mix, the quality of judgment and decision making deteriorates. Now, if you have, uh, if you have a latchkey child 
who comes home, uh, you know, a couple of hours before you get home from work. Uh, so what's the rule that you have? He can come inside, but nobody else comes in. Because you know, if another boy comes in, the likelihood of misadventure at least quadruples. And if three boys come in, anything can happen. And so you have a recognition of this, this change in, in decision-making that occurs based on the presence of peers. Now, it isn't necessarily that one peer dominates or, or pushes the child to do something. Uh, adolescents, the way that their brain processes information changes simply by the presence of another youth with them. So this is the rationale behind the laws in some states that a teenage driver can't drive uh, with another youth in the car unless an adult is present in the front seat. Because just the presence of this peer is going to undermine the quality of judgments that are brought to bear. The other feature of the developmental theory is that aging works. That because this offending is, is, is being significantly driven by an immature brain, as that brain matures, the quality of decision making will increase and the capacity to desist from crime will uh, be reduced as well. So that's this developmental theory. Now we'll add to that, that as we look at the quality of maturity that's brought to bear, it's not just a function of age and the associated brain immaturity, but also the presence of maturity delaying developmental factors. And we'll talk about those in a, in a few minutes that then lead to particular functional immaturity. And so one of the, the comments of the Odell court was to, uh, to encourage the trial court to do an individualized look at this particular defendant's immaturity, functional immaturity. And that's not just a combination of the brain immaturity that may apply to all adolescents, but specific maturity delaying factors that may be present uh, in this instance. And, and so let's begin with the first part of this. Let's begin with the with kind of an overview of the research regarding brain immaturity. So the, the brain changes that occur in adolescence can be grouped under four major processes. First, there are major changes in the incentive processing system beginning uh, in early adolescence. And this involves neurotransmitters as well as the connections that are being made with subcortical areas. And essentially what happens is that the reward regions of the brain and their neurocircuitry, the reward regions, undergo marked developmental changes. And associated with that, with this activation of the reward related regions, there is a greater willingness to engage in risky and socially motivated behaviors. Ones that, are, that involve risk taking and reward seeking and responses to peer influence. So the, there are changes in the incentive processing system. There's synaptic pruning. And here's what we're talking about there. Uh, the, the circuitry in your brain you can think of is like this electrical chemical bath. And there are the neurons uh, that transmit the information that neuron fires, either fires or doesn't fire an electrical impulse. That's all it can do is fire an electrical impulse or not fire. The neurons don't touch each other though. Instead, the uh, the dendrite of, of the sending neuron will come up very close to the axon or receiving fiber of the receiving neuron. And it releases chemicals that move across that space called a synapse, causing that receiving neuron to either fire or inhibiting it from firing. Well, prior to pr puberty, there are, there's this tremendous range of, of synapses and connections that are waiting to be made. 
Uh, and with brain development, there is a pruning away of the synapses that are not being used. Now, this is why before the age of 10 or 12, you can learn a foreign language just by being exposed to it. You don't have to have formal classes. You know, you spend three months or six months interacting with kids and living in another country and you just absorb that language. The synapses are waiting to receive that. Uh, you know, when I was in China and I observed three or four year old children speaking what seemed to me to be pretty good Chinese, I realized then that Chinese is not in fact a difficult language to learn because look, even three and four year olds learn it. Well, actually, they have this array of, of, of synapses that are waiting for it. So what happens then with brain development is the circuits that are not being used are pruned off so that the ones that you are using can function even more efficiently. So you give up flexibility for specialization and efficiency. So we got synaptic pruning. The, the total amount of gray matter in the brain is reducing as these neurons and synapses that aren't being used are discarded. And that progresses from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. And it leads to more efficient neural connections. Although now we lost flexibility to pick up things automatically like languages. This is a graphic that shows how the frontal gray matter, the, the total number of neurons here in the frontal lobes, peaks at about age 12 and then declines over the next 10 years. That's synaptic pruning that's occurring. Now this is a time-lapse imaging of this uh, synaptic pruning as the gray matter wanes in, the, in a back to front wave as the brain matures and these neural connections are pruned. And so this gives you a, uh, a time lapse, ages five to 20 of that process occurring. It's gonna, the, the gray matter is gonna grow to about age 12, then it's gonna start that arc of decline. The third feature of brain development in adolescence is substantial myelinization. Myelin is a fatty sheath that develops around that axon to insulate it, like insulating a wire. And because it's insulated, the electrical transmission down, propagation down that axon is speeded and made more efficient. So the circuitry is becoming insulated. And that also is progressing from the back of the brain to the front of the brain again with the frontal lobes being among the last to myelinate. And this results in more efficient brain processing. Now, the, the myelinization of the frontal lobes may not be completed until the mid 20s. And as we think about what the frontal lobes do in terms of impulse control and judgment and empathy and these higher functions, you can see how this is directly related to the quality of decision making that occurs. Now, as that connectivity and increased speed uh, develops, that supports executive function, like inhibiting responses, planning ahead, weighing risk and rewards, simultaneously considering multiple sources of information, shifting gears mid-track when you see this is in fact not going to work. So all of those things that we think of as being associated with maturity, with the difference between an 18 year old and a 25 year old. That's not just seven years of accumulated experience. The 25 year old has a fundamentally better wired brain. And then number four, there's an increase in the connections. The connections between the, up, the surface level, the cortex and the subcortical regions. That's really important so that the cortex exerts more control over those emotional processes. So as you move into adulthood, you have greater capability to modulate your emotions because the cortex is now having increasing influence to regulate emotional responses that may, that may rise. And so again, this is, results in a superior ability of adults to make mature judgments about risk and reward or to control their emotional 
uh, impulses, especially in socially charged situations. Now, remember, all of this is going from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, with the frontal lobes being last to get the full benefits. I'll give you a, a, a behavioral uh, uh, illustration of this. This has probably been 15 years ago. I lived in Texas then in Dallas, and my wife and I were going down the North Dallas Tollway, a freeway that goes from, north to, uh, from south to north as we're going back home. It runs north and south. Uh, and so we're going back north on the North Dallas Tollway. It's about 10 o'clock at night. We've been eating out. I'm doing about 80 on the tollway. And flying by me, it sounds like a swarm of mosquitoes. It's, ugh, flies by me. And there are five teenage boys on ninja bikes going over 100 miles an hour based on their passing of me all of them with their front wheels in the air. Now, that's an example of extraordinary coordination. Their parietal lobes that control that degree of coordination are exquisitely operative. And just virtually no frontal lobes at all about the risk benefit equation that's occurring here. And so that illustrates this capability for extraordinary skills and coordination on one hand with the part of the brain that's already gotten wired in, but deficient decision-making about how that coordination is operationalized. So uh, the other thing that we're, we're thinking about as we think about the reward processing system coming on stream early with that uh, incentive, changes in the incentive processing emphasizing reward, while these control structures having to do with synaptic pruning and myelinization and cortical to subcortical uh, connections, that is slower to come on. So most simply, that means that the gas pedal develops before the brakes. And that makes middle adolescence a period of particularly heightened vulnerability. So you have some intuitive sense of this. You, you might almost feel more secure about leaving your 12 year old unattended overnight than your 15 year old. Because the 12 year old has a 12 year old gas pedal and 12 year old brakes. Your 15 year old has 15 year old gas pedal and 12 year old brakes. And so that you, you see this operationalized even in your own parenting decisions. Now, so what are the behavioral implications of these uh, uh, physiological and neurochemical changes that are occurring? Well, number one, these adolescent brains are less capable of mature judgments. There is a propensity to engage in risky and illegal behavior. In fact, the scholars in this area describe that risky and illegal behavior in adolescence is normative. It's not deviant, it's normative. And often that risky behavior includes criminal activity. And again, what the research says is that it's statistically aberrant to refrain from crime during adolescence. So engaging in this doesn't reflect that you have this evil heart, the bad seed, it's statistically aberrant not to be doing this. Observation that both violent crimes and less serious offenses peak sharply in adolescence and then drops precipitously in young adulthood. This age crime curve is one of the most consistent findings across studies. It's what Shakespeare said about youth. So there are to go on with that, they're less capable of self-regulation. They're less able to resist social and emotional impulses. They've got a, 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 a risk reward calculus that emphasizes reward and diminishes risk. They have less ability to, to look down the road at the consequences or to, to take perspective of to take the perspective of others. So the behavior can seem callous because their brains limit their ability to take the perspective of others. They're more susceptible then than adults to negative influences of all types, neighborhood, family, peers, and they're not able to extricate themselves from these. 
And as I described before, they, they uh, as you would task an adolescent with a task, a certain area of their brain lights up to process this task. If you bring a peer in and sit up here next to them, they begin to use a different part of their brain to engage in the task that they're presented with. Now, on the other hand, if an adult is presented with the same task and a certain portion of their brain lights up, you can bring in somebody else and it doesn't change what part of the brain is working on this. And so it illustrates this differential activation simply based on the presence of a peer. Now, because adolescents are hungry for approval and fear rejection, because they're increasingly establishing their identity and relationship to the group, they're more susceptible to peer pressure, even without direct coercion. Nobody has to lean on them to do this. Their own desire for approval uh, will cause them to act in ways that they think will match the expectations of the group they're far more likely than adults to commit crimes in groups or in the context where the pressure of peers is a motivating factor. Uh, and so that ability to resist expectations of peers or normative uh, uh, behaviors of peers is, uh, is markedly reduced in adolescence as compared to adulthood. All right, uh, that's looking at brain development pre-18. What about offending in this zone between 18 and 24? The research demonstrates that youthfulness still matters, that brain development doesn't have a bright line stopping at age 18. In fact, all of these processes that we've been describing continue out into the mid 20s to about age 25, involving things that have such relevance for offending or relating behavior like judgment, impulse control, delay of gratification, appreciation of consequences, responsibility, empathy, that sort of thing. Now, this is captured in the language of Odell as it describes, thus when the legislature enacted RWC 99, 9.94a, it did not have the benefit of psychological and neurological studies showing that parts of the brain involved in behavior control, and there they're quoting from Miller, continue to develop well into the person's 20s. And then going on, these studies reveal fundamental differences between adolescent and mature brains in the areas of risk and consequence assessment, impulse control, tendency toward antisocial behaviors, and susceptibility to peer influence. So this is, a, this is not a dichotomous, you go to 18 and then it stops, now you're an adult. Instead, this is a continuous process out into the mid twenties. Now the research demonstrating that brain development continues out in up to about age 25 is reflected in six lines of research. And those are depicted here on slide 79. Of these, I wanna talk about two of them that reflect the behavioral expression of this brain development. So these others, the postmortal morphological, that involves autopsy sectioning and study of brains. Uh, you know, there's neurochemical, pharmaceutical, neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging. Those all have to do with assessments of the hardware. I want to talk a little bit about research demonstrating the output from this, this uh, brain development that's occurring. So there's research on from psychosocial behavioral assessment that identifies as the prefrontal cortex develops, all of these things are growing in their capabilities in a measurable sort of way as they assess persons across these years. Another aspect of, and as, and as these authors talk about this, about what psychosocial capabilities develop from the teens into the mid twenties. That includes processes like more complex thinking, appreciation for diverse views, mutuality and relationships, regulating emotions, quality of risk-taking and decision-making, 
and progressive availability of assets. In other words, you have greater redundancy in your capabilities. So, you know, your, your two-year-old may be able to be composed, but it doesn't take much frustration to unhinge them and put them into a meltdown because they just don't have much assets available to them to regulate and modulate their emotions. The older you get, the greater availability of assets you have, the greater redundancy there is that you can bring to bear. We can also look at morbidity and mortality data to illustrate this. Uh, this graph, uh, this bar graph reflects uh, the age of drivers involved in fatal crashes. And you'll notice, which is a, a way of, uh, of operationalizing uh, poor judgment and risk-taking in driving. And so the highest fatality rates you'll see are between ages 15 and 20. But notice that those, those drivers that are 21 to 24 are about 50%, almost 50% more likely to be involved in a fatal crash than those that are 25 to 34. You also see this in morbidity and mortality data involving homicide. The homicide offending rate for males age 18 to 24 uh, is 29.3 per 100,000 offend uh, into community members. That's twice as high as the rate will be age 25 to 34. So again, our morbidity and mortality data reflect the same thing. Now, there are other social expressions of this. Uh, that one of those is, is uh, cited in a footnote in Odell that you may not be able to rent a car if you're a male under the age of 25. Well, so this is a commercial application of this data that brain development is continuing. Or even if they do allow you to rent a car, if you're a single male under 25, you may be restricted from a high performance automobile or there may be a significant surcharge you pay or that kind of thing. Again, reflecting the actuarial experience based on this brain relevant morbidity and mortality data. We've been talking about brain immaturity that would apply to anyone up through age 25. There are factors though that can work to delay the development of functional maturity. So first we've got a baseline of brain development that's always gonna be present. Then there's an individualized examination that can be made of factors that delay this onset of, of or slow the progress of functional maturity resulting in someone who has particular functional immaturity. In other words, they may be 19 going on 15 in terms of their functional maturity. Uh, some of this comes out of the US Department of Justice and other sources that have identified the risk factors for delinquency and violence, as well as protective factors that buffer someone against some of those risk factors and inhibit the development of behavior problems. Now remember, we, are, we have identified that a significant aspect of delinquent and violent behavior in adolescence is associated with immaturity. So what are some of the, and so this research is saying, even within that youthful zone of risk, there are particular factors that increase the likelihood of functional immaturity as it's reflected in juvenile offending. So these are factors either risk factors that are increasing, that are slowing the development of maturity. There are also protective factors or developmental assets that may facilitate the development of functional maturity within the limited apparatus that this person is working with, this young person. Now, these factors on either side, whether we're talking about the factors that slow the development of functional maturity or we're talking about the factors that support maximizing functional maturity in light of this immature nervous system, these have a dose response relationship. In other words, as you add on risk factors, 
an increasing number of young people will choose badly. As you add on developmental assets or protective factors, an increasing percentage of young people will exert better judgment and will choose more wisely. They'll show greater functional maturity. So essentially we're beginning with this immature brain. Then there are two primary types of factors, neurodevelopmental and psychosocial, that may result in particular immaturity in the face of that immature brain. These are examples on slide 89 of neurodevelopmental adversity that, in other words, the quality of the hardware, the quality of the brain apparatus that's being brought to bear is deficient or limited as compared to a, an, an adolescent who did not have these neurodevelopmental uh, features in their background. On slide 90, here are a set of psychosocial adversities that were to slow the onset of functional maturity. Now, we know these because as, as, uh, as competent parents, we are trying to avoid exposures to these things among our children because we know that these would work to in fact limit them, result in greater immaturity, less capacity for responsibility and emotional modulation and that kind of thing. If we thought these things would accelerate the journey, that they would somehow result in precocious sophistication, then we want to inflict these on all of our kids. So they would grow up faster. So of course, that's not how this works. As we think about the developmental nexus, the research between factors that increase the likelihood of bad decision making that increase functional immaturity. There's research out of the Department of Justice. There's research looking at adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. There's also research looking at protective factors or developmental assets. And we'll just touch on some of this briefly. I provide you uh, references on slide 92 to the, some of the DOJ research that aggregates uh, data from many studies. Uh, I'll, I'll describe the features of one of these. Uh, it was published by the US Department of Justice where they identified a cumulative impact or a dose response impact that the larger number of risk factors, the greater the probability of violent behavior in the community. In other words, the more risk factors, the greater the functional immaturity, particularly regarding being law abiding. Now in this study, they identified six groups of factors that are reflected on slide 94. Uh, that, that had been identified in the research as increasing the likelihood of serious delinquency and youth violence. Uh, and then these next slides break those out for you. Now in the parenthesis next to these, that, like in this first one, hyperactivity, X2-5, those are odds ratios. Some of these studies in, involve logistic regression analyses that allow you to hold other factors constant to study the influence of a single factor. And so if the child were hyperactive, he is two to five times more likely to be involved in delinquency and serious violence simply from that factor alone, independent of the additive effect of other factors. So this is an example of how a neurodevelopmental factor results in a reduced functional maturity that can be brought to bear, illustrated in these data. So there are individual factors, family factors, school factors, peer related factors, community neighborhood factors, and factors that are situation or offense specific. Now another set of research involves adverse childhood experiences or what are called ACEs. And this comes out of large scale research that was undertaken by the Kaiser Permanente uh, Health Organization as they're trying to look at how to account for and perhaps how to reduce the morbidity, the illnesses that they're encountering in the people they're providing healthcare services to. And out of this research, they identified 10 adverse childhood experiences that have a dose response relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, 
with health issues across the spectrum, as well as premature mortality. Uh, now we can see the effect of this on functional maturity, again, on what happens with delinquency. And again, these have a dose response relationship. There's a large scale study looking at Florida juvenile offenders, a very large scale in over 64,000 juvenile offenders. Now the black bars are how often ACEs were present in the childhood history of this Kaiser Permanente sample, which tended to be a middle-class sample. And you notice that, uh, that uh, about 35%, 37, 38% of that Kaiser sample don't have any ACEs in their history. They got none of these. On the other hand, only about 2% of our juvenile offenders have none of them. So in this Kaiser sample, as you increase the number of ACEs that were in their, their history, you have a steadily dropping line of how many people that involves. Look at those juvenile offenders. So among the Kaiser sample, about 12% had four or more ACEs in their history. Among this juvenile offender sample, 50%, four times as many, had these ACEs. So you see, again, this dose response relationship between childhood adversity and bad decision making and involvement in juvenile offending. Now, those are looking at some, some of the research about this dose response effect of risk factors. There's also research on what are called developmental assets. These are things that you would like to see present in the, the, the uh, development of the child, 20 internal assets and 20 external assets that also have a dose response relationship. The greater the number of assets, the more often this ch the, the juvenile chooses well. And let me give you one illustration of that dose response relationship. So across this, the, this chart, if you look at the risk line, it's zero to 10 assets, 11 to 20 assets, 21 to 30 assets, or 31 to 40 assets. And what we're measuring here or examining is antisocial behavior, which is three or more incidents of shoplifting, trouble with the police or vandalism in the last year. Those youth with zero to 10 developmental assets had 24 times the rate of those as those that had 31 to 40 developmental assets. Again, reflecting that these are integrally related in whether a child or a teen is exhibiting greater functional maturity or less functional maturity. This is an illustration from a particular case of neurodevelopmental assets that, that were resulting in particular immaturity, as well as on the left and psychosocial adversities that were on the right that were resulting in particular immaturity. This is an example of individualizing these concepts to a particular case. Now, functional immaturity may be demonstrated in a number of ways as you look at your particular juvenile and as you look at the, the, offense, the, the misconduct history and the instant offense. One of, the, uh, one of the features that may be examined is the immature nature of prior offending. Uh, so this is an example from a case of things like curfew violations, runaways, uh, vandalism, shoplifting, uh, taking a car to run away to California. These are all offenses that are characteristic of teenagers. There's really not a very good adult equivalent to many of these. Uh, adults don't run away, they just leave. Uh, and so this, this illustrates that his history of juvenile adju adjudications illustrates the immature nature of his prior offending, including one offense 
where uh, one pattern where uh, he and, and some other teenage boys run away, uh, steal a car, uh, kind of forcibly steal a car from a guy at a convenience store, or, and are, then are driving to California. They get to California, they're living on the beach, they're there for about three days and decide, you know, this really isn't it either. Now what? Now, how are we gonna live? And actually it's kind of scary out here. So he calls his mom and she sends him bus fare and he gets on a bus and he comes home. And three days later, he runs away again. Well, wait, we just got back. And so the ability to even make use of the information, the experience, from the last time doesn't inform his looking forward to the next one. Uh, you may examine the, the instant offense for reactive and judgment impulsivity in that offense. Uh, and so in this instance, again, from a specific case, uh, in, this, in this case, the uh, the defendant and a co-defendant decided they were gonna run away and their plan was to hit his mother in the head to knock her out, then tie her up and take her car and run away with it. All right. So they then make a selection of a weapon of opportunity. They are walking home and they see a shovel in somebody's yard, so they pick that up. And this is reactive impulsivity, kind of they're making it up as they go. And then when she doesn't get knocked unconscious with the first blow, then she has hit some more uh, because that first shot didn't get the desired level of impairment. Uh, now, there was no reason cost benefit or future projection about this thing. Uh, now, they saw a brick and decided, no, that's too heavy. But there was little consideration of how utilizing a shovel could be similarly injurious as a, as a brick or that unconsciousness not, might not result from the first blow, or that a blow that creates several hours of unconsciousness could easily be seriously injurious or even fatal. What they seemed to be picturing was almost like a, a, a cartoon on television, that the character gets bonked on the head and passes out, and then comes to later without any effect. Of course, what happens is this blow to his mother's head is fatal, these blows as they're hitting her with the shovel. They gave no thought to the ongoing criminal jeopardy of car theft or what they're gonna to do to support themselves in California after they get there or if he's ever gonna resume his interactions with his mom. There is remarkable optimism, the reward basis that she'll just be temporarily incapacitated and otherwise uninjured. And their forethought is really extending no further than the next few hours or days. So as a result, he just goes into the police station to turn himself in. Well, I mean, several hours later, he realizes she's dead and this hasn't gone the way he thought. And so he just walks into the police station and turns himself in. Even then he displays bad judgment because he lies in his story to the police. The co-participation of youthful co-defendants we talked about in our model of, of how that uh, reduces the quality of judgment. The other thing that it does in reflecting youthfulness is that, that youth define themselves and experience themselves in light of the group. And so they may involve co-defendants when in fact this could have easily been carried out by, by acting alone. There's complete disregard that all of these people are witnesses that may ultimately roll on them and implicate them. Very often they're discussing this in advance on social media, or they're talking about it to even more people who are now potential witnesses. And so this notion of co-participation really extends even to creating needless witnesses that because they're experiencing this in the context uh, of the group. And finally, you may also want to look at adaptive skill immaturity. Now, adaptive skill is not reflected by living on the streets. Cats and dogs live on the streets. And so surviving out here as a teenager, runaway, homeless, 
living on the streets does not demonstrate functional adaptive maturity because they're not in school, they're not employed, they don't have a residence of their own. They are in fact not engaging in the sequence of things that reflect authentic adaptive skills. They are simply survival skills and there's an important differential there. And so for example, in this case, as we would think about adaptive skill immaturity, that was reflected in deficits in self-direction, in employment, in independent living, in financial management, in driving, as well as in courtship or parenting or those kinds of things. So you, we can also look at the same kind of adaptive considerations that might be in play in an evaluation of intellectual disability and look at where this person was developmentally as it also often reflects that they are deficient and even behind the curve as compared to their peers in the development of functional adaptive skills. This developmental model as is, is we've examined it is uh, is reflective of the current state of psychological science. And, and so this accounts for the endorsement of high courts in public policy applications of this. We are just about on time and on budget. We were supposed to go 70 minutes, we're at 72. Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you about this and I'm glad to entertain questions that you may have. Well, uh, Dr. Cunningham, um, I was fascinated with your idea of inflicting um, uh, when you said you could, you, we don't want to inflict any of these uh, deficits into kids. Are there, is there any way to inflict assets to use? Oh, absolutely. So we can get them to mature quicker. Uh, well, I mean, so, so again, please understand these don't make the brain develop faster. That's on its own track but there are psychosocial features that, uh, that can facilitate the development of functional maturity, uh, psychosocial assets. And, and I guess what we might think of those as vitamins. Uh, and as I said, there are 40 of those that are identified in this, this uh, Search Institute research. If you would like for me to uh, open a file that reflects those, I'm glad to. Uh, in the service of time, I didn't, present all 40 uh, of those, but I'm glad to send those to you as a separate file, or I can put them up now if it's relevant to, to look at those. Uh, as you examine them, they are things like music lessons uh, uh, and, and, and uh, with routine practice, uh, a reading, uh, encouragement of reading for recreation, uh, adults that are actively involved in the child's life, uh, caring neighbors that are also supportive and active and involved. I um, mean, all kinds of things that, uh, that have a dose response relationship uh, with, the, with the quality of decision making and functional maturity this child can bring to bear. So I know one program that uh, the juvenile court in Benton Franklin County has been promoting is a, a gardening program where you um, tend to garden and I think share the, I guess Elizabeth could help me out on this, share that uh, your crops with uh, other groups. Uh, is that a program that would help provide well, I, this? I, well, I haven't looked at their outcome data, but some of what you're doing there is, uh, uh, increasing a sense of, of reciprocal social involvement in a productive way, connecting them to uh, an activity that shows positive results, uh, you know, promotes cooperative interactions with peers in a pro-social way. Uh, so there are a number of features of that that may in fact get to some to, to begin to try to work on remediating uh, uh, what's occurring is we think about addressing this functional maturity. Let me, uh, let's, let's back up in this. 
as we think about the things that are involved, uh, you know, some of these, if there are neurodevelopmental factors, some of these are in play and are not easily remediable. Although the person may like, like these neurodevelopmental factors, uh, although supports may be brought to bear. If there's alcohol or substance abuse, then that involves rehab. If there's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it may involve medication uh, support. Uh, and so there are things that can help uh, ameliorate or reduce the intensity of some of these. Others in the psychosocial arena, again, uh, some of these may have already occurred. We may be getting down the line on those where now we're thinking about, so in the face of this, now what? Uh, are there, is, it, is there, are there psychological services? Uh, are there community-based services? Uh, juvenile confinement needs to be undertaken as a, as a preventive measure or, or to address this with great care because you're taking the child out of the developmental mainstream of school and peer interactions and dating and part-time jobs or those kind of things into an environment where they're separated from those and where you're maximizing their exposure to other troubled kids. And so the quality of services that happen in that juvenile center need to be particularly good and effective to justify the injury that it does by taking this child out of the developmental mainstream. Now, there may be no choice but to do that uh, as a quarantine for the specific deterrence uh, aspect, uh, but it does significantly increase the necessity of, of ensuring the quality of that uh, uh, institutional programming. There's a whole series of, I mean, part of the reason the Department of Justice was doing this research on risk factors uh, for delinquency and violence was to help inform community interventions to reduce those uh, risk factors. Um, and the local, the local programs like you were describing, I think, have promise, although I, I haven't looked at their outcome data. Dr. Cunningham, I received another question from a participant that um, was asking, has other research suggested that the adolescent brain actually matures at age 31? Well, you see on, on some of these, uh, you know, let's, let's go back to another slide of this uh, as we're looking at the effects. So our homicide offense rates continue to fall with age. Uh, our, our driving morbidity continues to fall with age until you get out over 70 and then it bumps back up some <laughs> because of uh, uh, you know, motor and sensory impairment and reaction time and that kind of thing. Uh, so this, this morbidity data or mortality data rather would tend to show that things are continuing to happen with brain development over time. Um, uh, the, uh, the greatest changes, I think, are occurring up to that mid-20s range. But what we're looking at in these statistics show that there may continue to be subtle effects that occur. And you know, that's like, even if somebody was 26 years old when they get married and it ends up not working out, very often they may describe, we were both so young. And that influenced the decision that was made of who they married or how they behaved in the marriage as opposed to their second marriage when they were 37. Uh, and so that also reflects this accumulated, not just accumulated experience, but uh, continuing developing brain. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, that study that you were referring to, is that, I believe that's the uh, Hawkins and Catal Catalano study from the, from the UW? Is that the University yeah. of Washington? Uh, that may well be, let me go there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, was, I was not aware this was from the University of Washington. Yeah, David Hawkins and I don't really know Catalano yeah. um, 
run the uh, one of the Justice Institutes there. Good. I did. So this is a study that aggregated the findings of about 67 major research studies, including DOJ longitudinal studies. And so they, they were uh, synthesizing these 67 studies. I think they brought 22 nationally prominent researchers together over a several year period to distill out of all of this research, these groups of factors. Uh, and even looking at the odds ratios of specific elements within these to identify its relationship with, uh, with youth violence. And again, with one of the most important findings being that there is this dose response or cumulative effect. Thanks for pointing out that this comes out of, uh, these guys are at University of Washington. So I think I'm the only one asking questions, but I've got another one. Um, you talked about risky behavior and almost illegal behavior being normative for teenagers. Yes. So when I go to court and I, my client is found adjudicated delinquent or guilty, uh, the court imposes standard conditions of probation, which basically say, you've got to be a good kid. And if you're not, we're going to put you back in detention. I, I'm struggling to see how that will advance the youth in, in any way of, you know, without, without becoming individualized, without having an individual evaluation of what's needed and addressing the risk factors. I, I'm not sure how this standard detention, uh, probation conditions really advance the youth. Sure, so to the extent that that teenagers have difficulty taking a longer, uh, engaging in a risk benefit analysis or taking the long view about how their behavior is gonna end up affecting things in the future. The imposition of this sanction doesn't then equip them with a greater capacity to make that judgment. Now it is a tangible expression that there was a risk that came out of this although they may not experience the probation as being particularly an onerous outcome. Their parents may, but it may not have a great deal of effect on them. It's kind of like if a kid is not turning in his homework and so then he gets an F. Well, that may be deterrent to his parents, but he may not particularly care on the short run of whether he turns in his assignment the next day. So I mean, I, I would agree with you that that standing alone without any understanding of what factors uh, are contributing to, to this and that uh, could be remediated or addressed is a, uh, has a, a much lower likelihood of being successful if we think we've addressed it by the imposition of probation. Thank you. Well, um, any more uh, any more questions in the chat, Nicole? I have not seen any other questions in the chat, um, but I, I did put in the chat that if you do have questions, um, I if you use the raise hand function, I can unmute you. Uh, I have not seen any raised hands either. Well. Um, so I just want to go back and point out that uh, Dr. Cunningham, although he is a national uh, evaluator uh, for, uh, for works in many states, he is actually based here in, in King County, I believe just outside of Seattle. Um, he's worked on several cases, serious cases here in, in Washington. Um, and I guess there is another question here. So, so let's see. Question, do you have, let's see. So what I've heard how of that would be individualized probation conditions. I guess asking whether or not you would need individualized as opposed to these basically standard conditions. Would that sure. be a, what? Well, yes, I mean, but also trying to understand uh, how do we get here and what's going on? And so if mom and dad are alcoholic drug abusing and the quality of supervision in the home is in play and there's domestic violence uh, exposures. 
uh, that are occurring. Then that you simply impose probation and conditions of probation doesn't address the home he goes back to every night or the trauma history that he's carrying about these exposures. And so if we're going to effectively address uh, or maximize the likelihood of a more positive outcome, then we need to figure out what is it that's wrong here? What, what's, what's the context of this kid's life? What's his history? What resources might we need to bring to bear to provide uh, services and treatment? I suppose the individualized probation might be one that prescribes participation in various interventions and that kind of thing. Uh, but simply the prescription of restrictions doesn't necessarily address, or particular restrictions doesn't address uh, the factors that are putting this kid at risk. Okay. An additional question. Uh, do you have examples of programs that help to provide assets to youth? I don't. I apologize. I have been here in, uh, in the Seattle area for about five years uh, and have not become familiar with the local programs uh, that are available. Well, um, Dr. Cunningham, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Uh, I will tell everyone that we have recorded this. If anyone wants to review it, it'll be, it'll be posted on the Office of Public Defense website, hopefully on the uh, homepage, but if not, it'll be under juvenile resources. Um, and if, well, we have a, we have some thank yous, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Nice, Cunningham. my pleasure. My pleasure to uh, spend this part of the afternoon with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Great, and thank you very much. And um, we're gonna just, if, you're, if anyone's interested in hearing more about the Regional Juvenile Defense Initiative program that Office of Public Defense is sponsoring or is providing the, to Benton Franklin Juvenile Court, you can stay on for a few minutes and the real Katrine Johnson, not me, will give you a summary of, of the program and, uh, and answer your questions about it. So Thanks. once again, thank you very much, Dr. Cunningham. And thank Thanks, you for I appreciate it. Uh-huh, bye-bye. Hi. And let's see, Katrine, can, are you on? Yeah, there you go. I'm here, I, sorry I'm late. I had to take my son in for a vaccine. Uh, so I look forward to seeing the full recording. And of course, I'm wondering why you're named me, George, but I guess we'll talk about that later. And the technology was never your strong suit. Um, hello, everybody. And thank you so much for being here for this training today. I, I, I don't plan to talk more than a couple minutes, but I'm happy to stick around and ask answer more questions if people have them. Uh, so George and I work at the Washington State Office of Public Defense. And one of the things we try to do is get resources out around the state to try to help with public defense. An area we've been trying to focus on, particularly in recent years, is amplifying the use of social workers as part of a public defense team. That's sort of a, a growing trend across the country. Um, of course, I think we all know that the people who are represented by public defenders are, are in need of a lot of services. And so the idea with getting them hooked in with social work services early in their cases through public defense is being able to get that early intervention and then also to help out the court, hopefully with more information by the time you get to adjudication and probation and things of that nature. Uh, certainly we hope that early intervention can also help prevent things like further detention um, or other consequences. So basically we wanna get the kids on the right path as soon as possible. And this is just another resource to add to what is already being offered at the county level. Uh, what we've seen in public defense with social workers is it tends to be the larger county agency public defense offices that employ social workers to be working side by side with attorneys. And an area that we see that is still far behind is in the counties where we have our contract defenders. 
and there doesn't seem to be um, as much structure around plugging in social work for the clients that they're representing. And so that's one of the, the, the primary reasons why we chose Benton and Franklin counties as a location for these federal grant funds. Because first of all, we hope that this would be useful for you all, but we're hoping that it can also serve as a model for other jurisdictions as well in how to integrate contract defenders and contract social workers. So a huge part, at least a huge financial part of this federal grant we have for the next two and a half years is using funds that our office is going to contract with two social workers who will be available to the juvenile defenders in Benton and Franklin counties to be part of that defense team to help identify early on what the needs are, what kind of interventions, make referrals uh, to the, the different resources within the communities and to help prepare that case also. Um, we have, currently have the RFQ out for that position. It is on our website at opd.wa.gov. Uh, if it's hard to find, we don't have the most intuitive website. Um, George and I would be more than happy to, to send that link to anybody as well. Uh, so we are currently recruiting for those positions. And um, another huge component of this grant is, is to bring you guys training. Uh, one thing that we've learned is that when it comes to juvenile work, we it doesn't always work when you're just um, training in silos. You know, the defense go to one training over here, prosecution to another, judges, probation officers. But there's such value in, in bringing everyone, all the stakeholders together um, to get that same information. And so what we want to do then is also bring you more speakers uh, like we had today, bring national speakers and ideally in an in-person setting, we will have in-person trainings. And oh, Nicole put the link to the position. Thank you, Nicole. And so we want your input. What kind of training would be helpful to you all? What are the issues that you're running against? We've got funds to bring in some national experts. So what kinds of, of topics would be most helpful for you guys in your day-to-day -day work and working with the youth in your area. So again, the social worker and the training are probably the two biggest aspects of this grant. We are, are greatly appreciative to be working with you all in the Benton Franklin area. And we're hoping that this does um, add to better, better outcomes for youth there. George, is there anything you wanted to add on to that? Thank you, Katrin. Um, just going, I think they described the program. I just wanted to say that um, there are resources that uh, Nicole has sent out to you, to anyone who had registered ahead of time, uh, one of which is the PowerPoint that you just saw. The other is a annotated bibliography of studies on adolescent brain development um, occurred as of, I think, 2019. So it's right up to date and it uh, provides a very good resource for you. In addition, I, I noticed that there must have been some students who were um, in the audience, and I would like to be able to figure out how to send this material to the students. Uh, if anybody knows who they were, um, be happy to happy to forward that on. Other than that, I think we've just about covered it. Any questions about the regional defense initiative here? Okay, there will be CLE credit. Um, we've applied for it. We are a little bit re hey, George. a little bit away from it. Yeah. Sorry, it looks like Angel's got a question. Okay. Hey, George. Yeah. Hey, just real quick, um, where are we at on, I guess, contracting with the attorneys on um, <laughs> what stats or whatever it is that I guess you want us to do so that we can perhaps start getting ready for that? Or Angel. do you have an idea? That, that's oh, that's why that's why that's why Katrina is here. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that. We we're behind because a little little case came out, um, State versus Blake, uh, which has has taken us in all kinds of different directions. So we are falling a little behind. But that that is the next thing on our list. We wanted to get that RFQ out for the uh, social worker, and then the next thing up is is the contracts with you all to pay you for your time. Michelle writes, uh, training regarding gang involved youth. Um, I think we can definitely come up with uh, an expert who isn't representing law enforcement exactly, but uh, 
we'll, we'll be able to find someone. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I think we're probably done. Thank you very much. Thanks for participating and we'll be in touch.